Just put it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do that. I'm going to big one's call to order the Thursday, October 12th, 2017 meeting of the Planning Board of the City of Northampton. To begin, we always have to offer an opportunity for public comment for anything that is not on the agenda. If you have public comment you'd like to make about an item that is not on the agenda, now is the time to do that. Seeing no hands and no one raising up, we'll move on to the agenda. Uh, before we call the first item, I'd just like to help everyone understand how this kind of works. I don't know how many of you are frequenters of this meeting. We, this is a conversation and a discussion between the planning board and the presenter and the public. It should not be a conversation or discussion between the public and the presenter or the public and people in the audience or people sitting next to each other. It's really a conversation that goes this way to help us understand how this works. We'll have a presentation by the applicant. We'll then have some public comment and some conversation from questions from the board. We'll offer public people who have the opportunity to have the public comment. We'll then close the public hearing and then we'll have a conversation amongst the board ourselves which we will then, you can stay as long as you like but that then ends the public part of the, of the meeting, and that's just kind of how the process works. Um, anytime we have this many people in the room, it's obvious that it's a very highly interested topic. There might be emotions that run high. We'd like to remind everyone that just like you, we're just citizens of Northampton volunteering to serve on the board and trying to do the best job that we can. So we hope that everyone can offer each other the respect and, and understanding of whatever position they might take there might be questions, might be issues that we can't address, and if that's so, we'll, we'll let you know and that perhaps there's a different venue for you to address your concerns. So just want to kind of lay that out there and let everyone know kind of how the meeting works and how we go about this. Uh, and I think Mark would like to say something before we call the meeting to order. Yep, uh, just for full disclosure, just because of the work I do, uh, I have and am currently working with both the uh, building and landscape architects uh, that are presenting tonight I don't feel it uh, prevents me from being objective, uh, but if anybody feels differently in the audience, if you raise your hand, I can just recuse myself from this hearing. Okay. I'm sorry. Does anyone object to Mark's participation? Seeing, hearing none. Okay. So I will call major site plan with shared driveway, special permit, open space, residential cluster, and special permit, commercial outdoor recreation, dog park, uh, Sarah, Sarah Schatz, Sh 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 <laughs> sorry about that, uh, zero, Glendale Road, uh, Florence map ID 94-4, if there, is there a presentation by the applicant? Uh, and I was just reminded by the technical people that if you're giving a presentation and you're going to be using these, if you wander from the podium, then no one will be able to hear you and it won't be recorded. So you need to stay pretty close to the podium. Um, I'll just give a statement, you know, up front to introduce myself and then, then get my team involved again. Um, Wait, wow. ma'am, oh, ma ma from the podium, oh, please. Podium. Remember, this is, this is a conversation between us. Okay, cool. Ma'am, no. ma'am, facing this way. Sarah. You're talking to us. <laughs> okay. I haven't done this before. Sarah, just stand right in front of there. Thank you. You don't have to move the microphone at all. Help me, Mary Ann. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you to everyone for coming tonight. Um, my name is Sarah Schatz, and I'm the owner of Sarah's Pet Services, which is a dog walking business, and I'm the founder of Wagon Trails Dog Park. Um, I've lived in Western Massachusetts since 2000. I live in Hatfield with my husband and three young children and three dogs. I started a dog walking business while I attended UMass for animal science and have been in business since for 17 years. I currently have eight employees and we walk between 50 and 80 dogs a day in Amherst, Northampton, and East Hampton. <clears throat> we all know dogs are an important part of our families and there are currently 2,000 dogs in Northampton alone. Our experience owning Sarah's Pet Services, which is a primarily off-leash dog walking business, <clears throat> made it clear that there is a high demand for off-leash walks for canine companions. I surveyed, uh, when I surveyed over 700 dog owners in Northampton, 70 responded that they do currently walk their dog off-leash. Unfortunately, the closest dog park is in Holyoke and Longmeadow, both of which are about an acre or less, 
which is not as appealing for many who would like to get a real walk-in. This leaves few options for dog owners in the Northampton area. In my survey, 35% said that they walk at the community garden and 37 on the trails of conservation areas in Northampton. This made it clear that although the Pioneer Valley is filled with naturally beautiful woods, people are confused by leash laws and privacy issues. Dog owners want to train their pets to be safe off leash, but they're afraid their dogs may run away or meet unfriendly dogs or unfriendly people. It's been my dream to build an amazing space for dogs and their owners to enjoy nature together in a safe fence property large enough for a hike. I've spent the last two years working to make that dream a reality. I believe not only will we make a park that will respond to needs and wants of dog owners in Western Mass, but also address issues such as dog waste, parking, and lack of cl clear rules that are present at the most common places dog owners currently walk off leash in Northampton. The land I found on Glendale seems to be a great fit for our plants and the best use of a parcel that contains many disturbed areas from a previous sand pit operation. I'm proud to say that Wagon Trails will be the largest dog park in New England and one of the nicest in the country. I have an amazing team helping me with the design and I'm excited to share details with you today. I had hoped to have a site visit and invite all the neighbors, but that was not allowed since I don't yet own the property. I really enjoyed meeting neighbors while I went door to door with Councilor LaBarge and I've already used their feedback to make changes to our plan and I will continue to respond to their feedback. I look forward to being a good neighbor and hope residents will take advantage of my offer to have uh, the first few years uh, if their dog meets requirements for free at our dog park. And Berkshire Design is gonna give most of them. Thank you, Sarah. this as large as we can okay I'm talking to you guys um, we are pretty excited about and you are oh yes I am Rachel Leffler with Berkshire Design Group um, Peter Wells with Berkshire Design is here today um, and Dan Bonham. Bonham is here also he's the architect on the project and we just came from a Conservation Commission hearing where we received approval with conditions Additionally, earlier today, our stormwater permit was granted also with conditions. So as I mentioned, um, permitting in general is a very, very detailed process. This is a flowchart um, we made in the office in the last month just to make sure we're dotting our T's and crossing our I's. Um, so concurrent mm -hmm. to our special, our site plan permit and our special permit for cluster development, we're also seeking a special permit for outdoor uh, recreation. Um, and then we were pursuing the notice of intent in, in town. So the site today is in off of Glendale Road. Um, it's a 49 acre site. It appears to have been um, excavated as far back as 1970 and early 70s for gravel. Um, the back portion of the site has since grown in with um, scrub trees and underbrush and areas where the where the mining operations excavated down to groundwater um, have become wetlands. We had a wetland scientist go out last year and delineate the wetlands um, and then we also surveyed that and that influenced our design on site. The site itself is a mix of meadow and forest, trails and gravel roads and out front is a very large, open, um, sandy gravel area. Off of Glendale Road, there is an existing road. Um, and, then, and then you open that. I'll, I'll show you the pictures. So here are some photos of what that looks like. This is an image of that road into the site off of Glendale Road and how it opens out to the gravel area. There's an image of some of the trails, a trail through the meadow. Um, some stone outcrops in the meadow areas and the open pit itself. So anytime we start to look at a design, we're coming at it from two different vantage points. One, we're designing experiences for people who might use this space someday. And then we're thinking about what sort of structures and physical things need to be built so those experiences can happen. We've heard from Sarah that she wants a really dog-friendly space, a place that dogs can run off leash and owners don't have to worry about them um, escaping. Uh, 
a place to showcase the New England landscape with diversity of habitat. Um, Sarah also has talked about providing educational um, training for owners on site and a place for developers to gather together. Additionally, we're trying to promote sustainability as much as we can, and we're working with Sarah and, and working with the regulations to push that as far as we can. So what that means for our dog park is that we have trails. We have 18 acres of trails. Um, they include woods and streams. Um, we, are we are providing, we're proposing a pond, um, sand dunes, a, a dog office, a washing station, um, parking, and connection to the bike trail. So on site, how that breaks out, we can break out the site into four zones. The first zone, close to Glendale Road, um, we are looking at breaking off a part of the land to, to promote cluster development. So that's a two-acre site. And the middle or front middle of the site is open today. We're going to redevelop that and restore that um, for m the large park area and then the small dog area and the, and the pond area. Area three, moving back into the site, is the majority of the, of the trails that are fenced in. We have 15 acres of trails fenced in. And the area in the back and four, we're going to parcel out and dedicate to conservation and restrict animal use to that area. So th this is how those functions are playing out across the site. Also, we should have mentioned that we are preserving a wildlife corridor through the site. So between areas three and two are open and not fenced. Um, if you are taking your dog from area two to three, you have to go through a gate to get there. So this is the existing site with all its <coughs> buffers. Lots of wetlands. It's kind of a Swiss cheese site. And this is a plan showing how we are, how our development footprint falls on the site. So as you can see from this image, the majority of our work is happening on the front part of the site. And we're mostly putting in fences and reworking trails in, in the back part of the site. So this is the front area and the back area. I'll take you some, through some of these areas in more detail. Um, this is a zoom in of that two acre cluster development off of Glendale Road. There are three separate lots that share a driveway. Um, the, they comply with the setbacks associated with the cluster development, 15 feet side, 20 feet front. Um, we are able to accommodate a less than 8% driveway through the site to get access to the back. Also, off of Glendale Road, um, we're going to reuse the existing curb cut drive access, and we're going to pave it and narrow it down a little bit um, to provide access to the park. Um, we've also drafted up a, a plan with meets and bounds for that, for that and divvying out of the cluster development. And we have a copy of that today also for you guys. Moving into the interior of the site, this is where all the exciting, fun things happen, dog related. Um, we have 28 dedicated parking spaces, asphalt paving. And that's really at the m middle level of the site. The site goes up to the north and down to the south. Across the site, there are about 50 feet of grade change from here to here. In the upper portion of the site, we are fencing in um, a little over an acre area for small dogs. And we have meadow planting and shade trees, a doggy dune area with a dedicated walking path around it. Uh, to the bottom of the site, below the, below the parking area, we have, um, a, there's an image over here of, of Dan's rendering of what the building might look like. The office building, which will which will hold um, a dog wash station, an office, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Down slope of that, we have in the natural low part of the site, we are hoping to build a pond that will be lined with clay um, and vegetated on the sides. And adjacent to that, we have a stormwater collection area um, that can handle the processing of the stormwater on site. These are some images of what, 
what mm -hmm. we envision the dogs doing on site. Mm -hmm. We have a doggy dune area up here for dogs to dig and play in. Um, the pond is sized for competitive dog jumping. This is, this is an event that is popular in some parts of the country. Um, so our pond is sized for the dock and, and the pond for that. And then we're, we're working with landform and shaping earth um, to make, make good play experiences and places for people within this previously um, open bit of land. <coughs> and this is, this is more of the, the technical drawing that accompanies that illustration showing the grading, the tree species, um, the extent of pavement and the locations of those features. I should mention that we've had a little bit of design evolution in the last month with Sarah and the architect. So some changes that have happened from the initial plans that you saw, we've pulled stairs away from the edge of the building um, and added some more lighting, which I'll talk about in a moment. And this is a zoom in of that upper area, how the grading works out with a large doggy dune mound um, and then gentle slopes along the side. We are also allowing for a mass DOT standard built to um, slope and width for a bike path, a shared use path going north to south across the site, which is shown here. That falls outside of our fenced area. Uh, and we are planting a lot of shade trees and uh, meadow mix and rain garden plants. Dan, do you want to talk about the building at all? Sure. Um, do we have elevations or just this? You have this, and then you've got that. OK. Um, so the, the building's a pretty modest, um, almost like a barn-like structure. And as you, this would be the view as you approach from the drive up uh, towards the parking would be on the right. The building is here on the left. Um, off to the left below it would be the Close it, or anyone know? Yes. Close. Um, to the left would be the, the water feature. Um, so it's a pretty simple 900 square foot on the main floor with an office, a welcome center, bathrooms, uh, and then it has kind of an L-shaped wraparound porch. Um, it's situated very well um, in the north-south axis, so on the south side we could have PVs on the roof. Um, the materials are pretty simple, um, be rough hewn uh, siding, metal roof, and um, not a whole lot of windows, um, but uh, the ones that are there are, are somewhat large. Um, so here's a series of elevations and a cross section of the building. Um, is there a plan? No. Um, but essentially, I guess this is probably the best way to see where you approach. You get a view. Um, here would be kind of a view spot out over across the water. And then um, a pretty large porch, covered porch area that you could get out of the rain if need be, or um, dogs could hang out in the shade. Utilities on site, we are using municipal water, making a connection on Glendale Road and bringing the water into the site to, to the office building. We also are making connections to the, proposing connections to the three building, cluster development buildings. Um, all sewage on site has to be treated on site. We do not have a sewage connection on Glendale Road. And we have sized and common plan for septic systems. Our civil engineer was out early in August this year um, and conducted test pits with the, with the Board of Health. Um, they found 14 feet of sandy soil before hitting groundwater. And it's kind of ideal for septic. Um, so we do have a septic system upslope of the office building. We're going to use an ejector pump to pump the fluent up to that field. Um, and um, and we, we have um, grade for gravity flow out of the buildings um, in the cluster development. Stormwater on site, um, there's a stormwater report that accompanies this and we just, um, we did receive approval um, with our stormwater permit. 
We are collecting uh, surface water flowing off the parking lot, sheet flowing into a rain garden to the north. Um, any overflow of that will then be piped subsurface to a rock boulder outcrop um, and then allowed to infiltrate in this infiltration swale adjacent to the pond. The pond itself, um, we will have a we will have a shallow um, a shallow well to provide non-potable water to it to keep it at level. Um, moving back into the site across across the intermittent stream, we enter in the 15 acre fenced in trail system area. This lighter green around its perimeter it is will have a fence. Um, there will be a double gate for dog owners and for access, and Sarah is looking into a key fob system so she can monitor all dogs and owners on site, where they are, and how often they use the site. We're going to reuse the existing gravel road entry into the interior of the site, um, and we were going to we're going to add a couple extra trails around the periphery so that we can have walking loops and figure eights for owners to walk through. We're also going to bring in a little bit of topsoil and reseed some of the meadow areas and clean them up a little bit um, so that there's a variety of vegetation. These are some images of what the existing conditions are and the existing features that we're trying to um, bring into the, into the design. In that larger area, we're looking at using agricultural deer fencing um, on site. This, these are some images of what it looks like. And then that in the back area, to offset our open space requirement for the, for the cluster development, our cluster development is 2.02 acres. Our back area, we're going to exceed the requirements for offsite open space. We are less than um, a quarter of a mile from the cluster development. We're looking at a little bit over nine acres of land to dedicate to conservation. Here's an image of what what that area looks like, um, and we have we are we're meeting the requirements for 50 percent of the area um, being outside of wetlands and outside of steep slopes. Um, those areas are shown with a thicker line within this 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 image. So as I said. We're placing 9.35 acres into conservation rest restriction, um, and of that area, 1.48 acres are are flatter than 8% and not wet wetlands. Also, there's 4.9 acres of wetlands in that area that would be preserved and, and kept. <laughs> with a dog park, we have to deal with dog waste, um, and Sarah has and have, there have been numerous conversations about this and it's something that we all take to heart, how, how to manage dog waste. At, at the base level, the minimum of the current plan is to um, have dog collection stations throughout the site that will be um, maintained and waste will be collected at the end of the day by her staff. We are planning on using biodegradable bags um, and collecting them in a dumpster on site. Pie in the sky, if things worked out. Um, there are two other avenues for waste collection that we might be able to pursue, and we would, of course, come back to you to talk about that. Um, one is Street Clean out of the UK has a municipal dog waste collection system in many of the cities um, where they're collecting dog waste on the city level and processing it for, to generate electricity and fertilizer. Another system out of Cal Colorado is a company that comes and collects dog waste, picks it, would pick it up from Sarah's dumpster, um, and then turn it into fertilizer to sell. So those are, those are things that we're very excited about, um, and we would like to go in that direction. But for now, we're planning for um, a dumpster on site. Lighting on site, um, we've, we submitted plans and we received comments about the amount of light fixtures that were originally shown. Um, and we also heard comments from some of the neighbors that they were concerned about the amount of lighting. And so we went back to our lighting designer and he was able to generate for us uh, a, a much smaller footprint for lighting. So now we are proposing only one light pole fixture at Glendale Road. 
and then we are proposing light pole fixtures in the parking lot um, and then down lights at the building. These would, these would turn off a half an hour after the office closed. Um, the park, I should also mention, is open dawn to dusk. We are, try we are meeting, we are well below the 0.8 foot candle threshold that's required for this zone. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations with the lighting designer about, about meeting that threshold. This is a zoom in of what all those foot candles are. I don't know if you guys can see them. Um, I have plans of those also for you guys today. These are cuts of the two fixtures, the slant fixture for the building, which we've, we've been in contact with the manufacturer to, um, this image shows that there are lights coming from above and below, and we've convinced the manufacturer to produce the, produce the light cut without enough light, so we will have no up light on the building with the building fixture. Um, we've had a lot of back and forth with the lighting designer about, um, about bug and glare. Um, that was one of the comments that we received. Um, he was able to work with the manufacturer to change the metrics to get the bug rating down to one for the glare. Um, but if that is an issue, a condition, we can go back and continue to work with him to meet the requirements that you, that you desire. I should, he did tell us that a, this fixture, um, if we went to a fixture with a zero glare and zero up light and bug, it would be twice as much as this fixture proposed. And I, I have a copy, a full copy digitally of the permit set um, as it stands today if you guys have any, any questions. Quick question on the lighting, the, the bug rating that was at one but not zero, but you reduced the number of lights overall from what was submitted from what to what as far as quantity. Um, can, So you, had, you had one at Glendale Road. Yeah, so we have one at Glendale Road and three at the parking lot today. And before we had four at the parking lot and nine on the drive. So we've significantly reduced the number of lighting. And this, the glare rating for one applies to each of those four fixtures? Okay. And the way he explained it to me with the, with the glare concern, that to have a glare of zero, you have a very narrow down light, a very narrow cone. And to have uniform light across an area that you're trying to illuminate um, you start to have to place the fixtures very close together. And so he's trying, was hoping to balance that out. Mm -hmm. I, hate, I hate to use this term, but there's a dog leg down at the bottom left hand <laughs> side of that piece of property. Mm -hmm. And you haven't discussed it at all. That area, so when we were doing exploration of the site, um, it, the, we, had a, we had another design before, before what you see here today. We had a much robust trail system that extended back into the site. Um, after our wetland scientists went out and flagged the wetlands and we saw how substantial a footprint this is, um, we, we decided to, to pull back uh, this work. We are leaving, um, and you'll see from the, the conservation restriction map, we are leaving a bit of the neck open to Sarah for however she wants to use it in the future. Um, if she would like to expand out this way in the future, she would have to, again, go through all, all the steps of having, having the resources delineated if they're there. Um, and, and coming before the appropriate entities. But for now, it is 
Um, it is land that just the way it is. It's going to stay the way it is. is. And how many acres is that? Um, it's about about ten. Ten or so acres. Yeah. Right. Up the public, and I'll just ask you haven't mentioned traffic. Oh, yes. Which is always one of the topics we deal with. So, if you could try sure. to address that on the front end. Um, our traffic study was prepared by Mark Darnold, um, a civil and traffic engineer in our office. Um, in the report, he talks about using the, um, the Institute of Transportation Engineers guidelines for determining both the average daily trips and the peak hour trips. Dog parks currently are not categorized within the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Um, so we looked at a park as, as the basis for the numbers. So our numbers are based off of what they provide for park visitation. Um, with that study, um, every road has a theoretical capacity according, according to this designation. A two-lane road, uh, such as Glendale Road, has a theoretical capacity based upon its width and dimension. We also received uh, trip numbers from the city of Northampton for Glendale Road. They were a little less than 2,000 trips per day, which is pretty low for the size of road it is um, in terms of transportation engineering speak. Um, you could see, and for this type of road, you could see that, that amount of um, trips being per hour um, would be the holding capacity of this type of road. Um, for this project, we, when we went through the numbers and went through the calculations, our peak, our, our peak um, trips were six associated with the park based upon the square footage, number of parking spaces, and this type. Um, six is not changing the level of service on the road at all. Um, and even, I mean, the park, the road capacity has, has enough to support it, according to that. Um, a level of service is, would still remain an A level of service in terms of the transportation engineering standards. So just to help to clarify, so if this becomes the most successful dog park in America. The capacity of the road in front of it that it's off of that already exists, even if it's at the highest level, the percentage basis would not change the nature of that rating of the road that, that's already there. Is that, am I understanding that? I, I would think so, yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we could run the numbers on, and yeah. So there are a couple things. One, in the, the zoning requires that the applicant analyze um, the impact to the level of service, which was explained, and the peak hour trips. Um, so generally, when engineers do a traffic study, they look at the drops in level of service and um, peak hour trip generation. Our zoning also requires, even though generally, um, the standard language coming out of the traffic engineer is that this is insignificant. Mm -hmm. Our zoning specifically says every incremental in, um, change in um, or new trip generated has to be addressed. And the zoning requires that it be addressed based on the district um, in that and based on the number of peak hour trips. So um, as you've seen in projects that you look at, um, um, that come before the board, every residential project, commercial project, unless it's in certain specified districts, have to address those incremental increases in trips that are generated. Um, and the applicant can do that by either making improvements to the network, uh, physical improvements, they could be anywhere from sidewalk construction or um, intersection safety improvements for pedestrians, um, uh, or alternatively, without making um, those physical improvements, a payment into a traffic mitigation fund could be um, offered. In this case, um, even though 
the engineering analysis says, you know, this is insignificant, but to address the zoning, the applicant is providing a public easement for um, a potential um, bike path or trail connection to allow access other than, you know, across the city that will connect actually to the ridge development ultimately if the trail system is built. The applicant is not building that, but offering the land has a significantly more, great, a greater value than making what the zoning would require in terms of a payment in lieu of that impact. Mm -hmm. So that's how the applicant is proposing to offset their um, traffic. So they're providing that easement, which is outside the fenced-in area, mm -hmm. but they're not actually constructing that. That's right. Okay. The, so that we value the land or the easement that's being dedicated for that purpose. Mm -hmm. And we've done that on other projects as well, so it's not unique to this situation. And, and so what the, the issue, the, um, so what that does is sort of banks an access and ability to connect the network across sort of the southern part of the city. And we started that on, you know, west of here at the Ridge subdivision, which is west, northwest of this property. Um, and goes through the property that the city just um, acquired through limited development at what was formerly known as the Kensington Estates. So um, it's one of those issues where we collect the pieces of the puzzle but can't necessarily implement it right away. Sometimes when we've collected the pieces of the puzzle, we've, we've, we've had the applicant construct like sidewalks to nowhere that aren't connected on either end. Right. What, what makes this different that they're just providing access to, for the city to construct a pathway in the future but not actually constructing it? Um, well, they're, they are actually constructing a sidewalk on the frontage of the property, so okay. that there's no, no okay. sidewalk okay. now, right. so that's their piece. Okay. Um, that's that yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions from the board before we open it? Um, Rachel, can you describe again the numbers um, relative to the open space? I saw a chart up there, but I, I don't think the board has seen the actual number. Um, so, um, and the amount of open space that has to be put in a conservation restriction um, of some sort um, and how that matches. Because the entire project is essentially the cluster development. Um, so the developed portion of that area has to be offset by an amount of area that's currently protected from development. Um, I pulled that up with the chart, and then also this is, I've got a couple copies of the, the larger version. So the, there are 2.02 acres out front that we're subdividing into three lots in the cluster. And then what is the portion of the dog park area that's developed, not the trail section, but where the parking and the building is located? I didn't calculate that, but that would be the whatever um, 49.6 minus the 2.02 .02 minus the 9.35. Minus the 10 acres in the back, too. Well, that is the 9.35. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to look at the numbers. So the, the issue is just wanting to make sure that to, in order to meet the cluster requirements, you have to set aside an equal amount of open space as being developed of which a small portion can be wetland, 25% can be wetlands. Um, so I think those numbers just have to be clarified. Um, and that has to be within a certain distance? Well, the whole project, because it's a cluster, so right now it is within a certain distance, um, and then there would be, um, and, and so that, that piece of it has been met. I guess I'm a little confused. Are we saying that the 9.36 open space lot 
may not meet the requirements of the minutes? Um, I, it could, if it's not inclusive, I, the, the developed area also has to include the dog part portions developed, so that okay, number okay, may okay. not be. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I just, so but just I haven't seen the numbers, that, so right? don't, okay. yeah. Okay, uh, we'll open it for public comment, and if we can go about this in an orderly process, that would be helpful. Anyone that would like to speak? Yes, yes, sir. We'll kind of alternate, we'll go back and forth. Uh, you have to come to the podium, please, and identify yourself and where you're from. Hi, uh, my name's Alan Dorman. I'm an abutter. Um, my address is 229 Glendale Road. Um, um, can I just, mm -hmm. for clarification, can you give the technical definition of what an abutter is so that people understand oh, that? Sure. Well, there, there is a legal term for abutter under the state statutes that abutters are notified of public hearings um, for um, projects that come before any board. Um, so the way the state statute defines the abutter is the person immediately adjacent to the property that shares a border and those within 300 feet of, um, of that is on the same side without crossing the road. Um, those are the folks that are legally required to be notified. Um, and then there's notice that's published in the newspaper and then the city does an extra notification by requiring applicants to post a yellow sign at the road. So anybody going by who may not be officially an abutter under the legal, in the legal sense um, can see that there's something, you know, happening, a public notice sign. Right. Thank you. I just want to make sure everybody stood with that. Thanks. Um, I have three questions and then a comment. Um, my questions, clarification was about the three cluster housing in the front. Is that uh, land, or, or is that those building lots going to be open to the open market, or is that um, for developers to, is that Sarah's responsibility to develop those and sell those properties on her own, or is it just being, and with some type of control, it's a type of building that's going to be built, or is it um, just open to the open market? That's one question. Um, the Another question was about parking. Um, Sarah was kind enough to come around and, and meet several of the neighbors, and we had a discussion about the number of parking spaces. Um, I believe that in the presentation that was just given, there was mention of 24, was that correct? 28. 28, okay. Which was down from the number that Sarah had told me a week ago, which was 36. My concern is the popularity of this place that may take off, and where would additional parking be if there were 36 members um, 36 at the, pro or 28 at the property, where would additional cars park, or are they re refused, or what's the process there? And my third question was about this bike path connection, because just behind my property, there would be a fence, and just on the other side of, well, I think the bike paths, from my understanding, was a bike pass path access or for a future development um, by the city theoretically um, and then the fence and where that would be and then my my comment would be about the traffic um, for those of us that live on Glendale Road we know that traffic is it's a major cut through commuter wise and and to say that it's a a um, acceptable two-lane road that can handle more traffic to me is really questionable and the condition of the road is not the best either so um, that's my comment thank you thank you um, would the applicant like to address those questions so the first one was about uh, the cluster housing how will that be addressed and Um, I'm, I'm <clears throat> I would be selling um, that piece of land. I'm, I'm, my hope is to not individually sell the lots personally. 
because I need to focus on this very large project <laughs> that I'm managing. Um, but I'm, I'm in talks with one-on-one um, -on -one talks now before I even own it to try to find a builder that I know and you know I think would be a great builder. And then the parking also, I she can, can talk about that. Yeah. So we've built in some flexibility for expansion in the site design. Um, we do have the 28 dedicated paved parking spaces out front, but we have room for a, a about, about twice as much um, on either side grass parking. If we were to pave it, we, have, we would of course come back and look at the stormwater and, and modify our documents um, for approval. And the and bike path just question? Just the bike path mm -hmm. um, clarification. And I don't know if that's a question that, Carolyn, that you want to address, or is it that? Uh, About, um, is that Just a, location? Uh, the bike path. Yeah. Oh, the bike path location? Yeah, yeah could you put the, the So uh, what? You, no, go ahead. With okay. You might talk about the separation. Yeah. Um, so where the bike path meets the street, um, is adjacent adjacent to the road entryway. It's to the north side of the existing drive. Um, it goes into this into the site, um, and then you have an option to cross a crosswalk into the sidewalk in front of the dog park building, or <laughs> continue north. Um, and I think probably a better graphic of that would be this overall plan. So this is the road that I just described, um, and the bike path is to the north of that, and then it shoots up to the north to the connection that um, Carolyn was talking about. Um, and, and as far as fencing, I should probably zoom in for that. This lighter green area is the area that is fenced in for the dogs. So the dogs in here are not able to run out into the bike path. Um, but there is no fence along this side, and it remains uh, open, to this, open to the street. So this is, again, that edge of fencing for the dog area uh, and the path that comes out to the street. And just to clarify, the bike path, you've, you're speaking of it as, it as if it's going to be built, but it, you're, getting, you're providing an easement for it to be built in the future. Correct. OK, Correct. so it's not going to be, OK. Correct. And there's, there, there are no plans now. Plans. There's no money. There's no, no design. Yeah. So. It's, it's, in the, it's, it's land in the bank to. Right. Right. OK. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Uh, um, I, I think there was a person over on this side, so we'll go back and forth. Yes. Hi, Marsha Fellows, 123 Glendale Road. Uh, traffic, I just want to re reiterate that Glendale Road is has been obnoxious the last 10 years because it's heavily tra traveled. I, I admire Sarah for what she's doing, and she's improving a place that needs to be improved. The uh, uh, traffic studies that were done on Glendale was one time, I remember, for the landfill. And they chose to, to do it on a day that the landfill was closed. So these are the kind of things that have happened on the street where you tell us we have had a traffic study, but hence it was done when the landfill was not operating and there was no traffic to the landfill back and forth. If you come to our, our vicinity between 6 and 8 and 3 and 5, we have become a crossover because there was a detour a couple of years ago, and people said, wow, this is a great crossover now. Uh, we are 35 miles per hour, and I think going by my house, it hits 55 miles per hour. Now, the upcoming bike path, I was involved quite a bit with the Kensington, Kensington Estate, and now the land has become conservation, and I have told them to push the landfill fence back because people now are parking on the tree belt to get into the land that is conservation. And, and just in general, water pressure. I know you replaced the pipes, but I have four houses coming around mine that haven't been built yet. You have three houses more, so that's seven, and then uh, a working building for uh, water. So I, I was just wondering about the water pressure, uh, the traffic, and, and any improvement to Glendale Road would be appreciated. I have gone to DPW many times because I right now have a standing puddle in front of the house, 
and I'm paying the community tax, the rain tax, as they say, to watch the water go over my fence. So Glendale Road needs more, more uh, improvement because you've put a lot more out there. We, we used to be a small country road. Now we've got uh, nonprofits there, uh, ServiceNet. We have a handicap facility. We have uh, another handicap coming in through Habitat Through Humanity. These are all good things. I'm not against it, but you have not approved anything on the road to make it safe. Now, people actually have traveled up the path to park into this conservation area to walk and stuff. So I've got cars parking all over the place. And my suggest suggestion was gate two, push it back. at city property so people can come in. Now with this bike path, Sarah, would she be responsible for in, the, in years to come, be responsible <coughs> for people who are not coming from the center of town by bike, they will come by car, take the bike off the rack and travel all the area you propose and so where are they supposed to park parking is going to be a big concern on a small you say glendale road can handle it but sure but when people start parking on the sides it comes a one way one way uh i mean you've just got so much out there now that and you haven't done any improvements to the area in in drainage in traffic and doing anything to the road now, I'm not saying us neighbors want you to expand and put big sidewalks and expand the road, because I'll be watching the cars go by the house, not hearing them. <laughs> so that's something to keep in mind. You People keep throwing things out us at Glendale Road. We have a recenter. We have a transfer station. We have all these nonprofits and blah, blah, blah. But you do nothing to improve the road. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I'll just... And I'll just clarify that this isn't the particular venue or that, that for discussing the road and the paving and the improvements, that's not within our purview. Uh, it's this project, and, and I understand your concerns, and I appreciate that, uh, but just it's, this is not really the venue that we can actually do something about the condition of the road and, and, the imp and those types of improvements. So I think there was someone over here. Uh, yes, ma'am. Can I say something before that? Oh. I after talking, you know, I'm in total agreement with the neighbors about that. That's not hopefully against me or my project, and I'm happy to go and work with them at the DPW to try to make improvements, because as a business, I, I don't want to pretend that it's not an issue. You know what I mean? So I, I just want to state that I'm perfectly happy to work with you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Chelsea Klein. I am not a dog owner, I am not an abutter, I'm a hiker, and I'm a mom of three. And very often when I'm out in the woods with my kids, dogs that are off leash, that should not be off leash, approach us. So I am here tonight with my two kids in tow, which is not easy on a weeknight, to express my very enthusiastic support for this project because I would love for people to have a safe place to go, to let their dogs run and be happy dogs and not get in my kids' faces or splash mud on my kids or bite my kids or all those things. So. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Yes, sir. <clears throat> My name is Ernest Parody. I live at 255 Glendale Road. And I'm wondering with this project, is it absolutely necessary for the housing cluster to go in with the dog park? I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding your question. Well, you're proposing to put in the dog park, and there's also going to be a cluster of three houses up top. Mm -hmm. Does all that have to happen? So you're going to have the traffic from the dog park mm -hmm. and the traffic from the three houses? Well, I think, um, I mean, it's really more for the applicant. The, the housing is allowed, um, and by special permit, the um, outdoor recreation or dog park is allowed by special permit for the planning board. So it's, um, and there's enough land area to support that in accordance with the zoning. So it's really, that's the proposal that's been pitched to the board. I think um, it's, um, 
that, so I don't think the board can answer that question. I guess. Yeah, as, as whether it's necessary, uh, that's not really something yeah. we can answer. I, it's I just found out tonight about this, so yeah. I'm just like okay. sitting here with my, I could understand the dog park. Yeah. It's just but when you add all of this together, it's like, mm -hmm. wow. And, and I understand that, but it, it, you know, this is the project that's been presented to us. It's not, we, we can't make that determination of whether it's Thank necessary you. or not. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. City Councilor Larry on the barge. And Thank you for waiting. I have to say, out of all the development that I have handled in Ward 6, this one here had no communication at all. No. I have to say, thank God I've met Sarah. Her and I, just recently, have been trying to reach out to non butters and people on one jail road. Sarah called me a year ago in regards to how she was looking at purchasing Willard's property. And she asked me about the neighborhood and so forth like that. So she did say that she would let me know how things were going. I haven't heard anything, but just last month. If things were differently, and we've done a lot of development in Ward 6. And we had private versus private. And I've worked with them also, where they would come forth and say, what can we do, Counselor? OK, what can we do? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I did not have the opportunity, opportunity to reach out to my residents on Glendale Road, Brisson, and Park Hill Road Extension. These are non-abutters that are just as valuable also as abutters, okay? I treat them all equally. And I just find, and I know you have nothing to do with this, but I've talked with the mayor about it again today. I have great concerns of how this was handled. If it was also an owner who gave the city the rights to first refusal, we'd be having all these informational meetings, and I've been here before, where it made it much easier for people to understand exactly the process and try to make things go right. And this was not right. I have to say that for, for the first time as a counselor. And I feel bad for Sarah too, because her and I, and I did not even know when these plans were coming here. And thank God that I was able to get a call from her realtor to meet with her. She called me a week before about, you know, meeting with her and again, hopefully, to see what was going to be happening here. I feel that there's a lot of questions to be answered in these plans. And I did state to the mayor today, I have great concerns of, I like the idea of, of the dog park, but I have concerns about the increasing of traffic. Going with Sarah, we've been going and trying to hit door to door to get this communication out there. And there is concerns. We've had nothing but traffic on Glendale Road. Yes, you have nothing to do with the roads. I've already talked. I'm going on site with the Department of Public Works next week. We're looking at Marshall's property again and two others to see if we can put a Burma on the drainage problems. This bothers me when I am hearing that all these towns and cities can use this private membership dog park. I can't tell you the traffic we have now. I don't know how this figure of 50 to 55, Sarah, maybe you can explain this, mm -hmm. of, and how many, and I told her about parking, keep the cars off of Glendale Road. We're not going to call for this. We have children down there. I have elderly on that street. It's a safety issue here. Okay. And I, I want to know, 
is there going to be a limit on the membership? This is crucial here because 50 to 55 cars a day, that's a lot of cars. Seven days a week this is opened. I have elderly people on Glendale Road, on Brisson, and Park Hill Road Extension. They don't even have, some of them don't have computers. Had no knowledge of this happening. Thank God for one of my residents, Marlene Pearson, who has kept contact with them, helping them on the communication of what was going on here. And I do thank you for that, Marlene. It's not been easy for me as a counselor, and it has not been easy for my residents on Glendale Road, Park Hill Road, and Brisson. I couldn't get to all of them. Sarah tried. She's running a business. I'm a counselor. Heavy, heavy schedule, believe me. And it made it very difficult. So I just want to let you know, safety is a big issue. I am going on site with the department head on, on Wednesday, Thursday of ne no, Wednesday of next week, 10 o'clock in the morning, house number 250 on Glendale Road. Big concerns, a big safety issue. Yes, we do have a residential home, and these are dis disabled people there. And they're in a single family home, and they have the rights to be there. Anybody has the rights by the zoning and by the amount of people living in a home. That's the rights. They have a disability right also. Beautiful home. They have a van. They don't drive. That dog park, if you come, it's on the left-hand side. The dog park is here, and the house is directly on the opposite side. It's a long driveway. We have two dangerous curves. I'm saying dangerous. I had to have signage put there way back because of children. Now I do have disabled people in a home, okay, where it, they are excited. One of them, I'm very excited about wanting to come over and walk around by the dog park and so forth. I don't think so because that person will not make it, I can tell you right now. It's not going to make it. We are going to be looking at some serious injuries here. And I know there is a mitigation on traffic. And I think that the planning board really needs to hear me on this, on the mitigation phase. Something needs to be done at that site on those two curves. Some form of lighting, crosswalking, to protect these people attempting to go across the street. Also, I have many people who will be walking coming down to that um, dog park. It's going to be very, very dangerous. 50 to 55 cars. I want to know if there is going to be a cap on the membership. I am being told Boston could come, even Connecticut could come. Where is the fine limit on a residential area? This is not right. So I am hoping that you really look at these plans, which I think are great, but we have some serious, serious traffic issues there and safety issues. Thank you. Thank you. John? Yes. What was the um, trips per day currently on Glendale? Uh, 2,000. Okay. That was, so the, the counts that we have are from 2007 before the landfill closed. It was taken over a week period, so, um, you know, a full week of counts to come up with that. So that was when the landfill was fully operational. Um, we don't have a count since the landfill closed. That, that I'm aware of is the, and, what I've seen. And what sort, what sort of uh, conditions or, or, um, or what can this board uh, do in regards to traffic on Glendale Road uh, as it was, I mean, what are the parameters uh, that we can put in that would require city to do anything? 
Um, the board couldn't condition the city and other department to do anything. Um, so the way the city addresses different um, road conditions and traffic is by, I mean, there's, you can imagine there's a backlog of um, streets that need to be addressed. Um, and they're, um, you know, based on the 2007 numbers, that volume is right in there with many, 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 many other streets in the city. And then we have many higher volume streets. Um, uh, Burt's Pit Road, Florence Road, et cetera, are three, four, or five times the volume. So it's really, I mean, it, you know, DPW has an assessment process for looking at what improvements need to be made. And if there are a little safety improve, I mean, we also have the Parking and Transportation Committee that looks at where can funds be allocated for certain, you know, basically hot button press, you know, um, issues. So that's a separate process, but the board can't dictate um, how to manage that process. But we could talk about the proposed traffic mitigation by the applicant and say, I mean, I guess we could have a conversation is if the, is the easement the, the best form of traffic mitigation that the applicant could do for this project. Right. I mean, you could, but with the zoning, you also can't dictate. Like the, the applicant gets to pick what form of mitigation and prove that they're meeting the requirement in the zoning. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, and we're talking about 55 trips spread over an entire right. day. Right. So, you know, that's 12 hours, dawn to dusk. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you're saying broadly, like that, right. in theory, we could thanks other public comments yes yeah. hi I'm Marlene Pearson I live at 196 Glendale Road um, I have a couple things to say because I, I don't want to keep saying what other people are saying so for efficiency I'm gonna try to just stick to the facts um, I'm sorry, can I, did you say 196? Yep, 196. Um, first of all, I want to say this is an unprecedented business that's going into the city of Northampton that has never been here before. So I think we need to um, really thoughtfully consider the whole entire plan. Um, I also feel very strongly um, that you, as a board, um, should delay your decision making because according to the permit application, um, it was made very clear in the permit application. Um, let me find the page here that says it. <clears throat> uh, the anticipated purchaser of the property has engaged with the neighbors as well as we'll be holding some public open houses prior to the hearings scheduled with the city. So uh, in the previous meeting that we were just in, um, she said that she wasn't allowed to hear any, uh, have any public open houses because she wasn't allowed to be on that property to have a public open house. And I just want to say, not really a good excuse. She could have gone to Florence Civic Center. She could have gone to Ryan Road School. She could have had a public open house anywhere. It doesn't say in here that it has to be actually on that property. So I want to say, if we're going by the actual permit application and things that she has put in here saying that she is going to do, she absolutely did not notify the public. She didn't have a public informational session for all of us to be able to talk about this ahead of time. So that's number one. That, that she actually didn't do in her own application. And because that wasn't done, and because we're talking about her permit tonight, I feel like you shouldn't even be discussing approval of anything, because she didn't do that, number one. That should have taken place, number one. And that kind of goes with what Marianne was saying about, we didn't even know this was going on, so we have not had a fair um, question and answer 
uh, collaboration. There hasn't been any of that going back and forth. So we're actually wasting all of your time here tonight because if we had had done all of this, we would actually have a nice succinct meeting where we can get down to the issues. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing I want to say about that. So please take that under advisement that, you, that I don't feel that you should be approving or disapproving anything tonight because we really haven't had any information ahead of time that she promised she would do. Um, another thing I want to say is um, in her application it says that there is a big need for a business like this in our town, okay? Something that hasn't been brought out is um, the survey that she put out that I don't believe any of us on the street ever got or were submitted or knew that was out there, I don't believe she solicited information from the actual neighbors on that survey to, to really get a good feel for maybe some more of the things that should concern her. And five minutes, literally, you can <clears throat> GPS it, I'm not kidding, five minutes from the actual site that she's proposing to put this business on in West Hampton, located on 250 Southampton Road in West Hampton is a 50 acre privately owned dog park that people can actually bring their dogs to and they can walk them off leash. Now, I will be forthcoming because I like to be transparent. They only have a one acre enclosed fenced in area because once the dogs learn to walk off leash, the owner of that property allows your dog to walk in the 50 acres of open trails that aren't enclosed with fencing, and you can do it as a paid member. So again, I feel like this is such an unprecedented business. I don't know why we're having a huge conversation about this when I don't feel that there's a big need in Northampton for it when five minutes outside of Northampton, this is already existing and people can use it. So another thing that we need to talk about is um, as far as the traffic study is concerned, I want to say that everything that you are talking about when it comes to statistics tonight about 55 this or 30 cars that or whatever is absolutely non-applicable. The traffic study that was done and it says in the actual traffic study they did not use correlating statistics. So you are all talking about these 55 cars but it's based on a regional park. It is not based on an unprecedented unleashed private dog park because there are no statistics that exist for that right now. So again, we need to think about using data that is actually applicable to our situation and that data is not applicable to our situation. Also, the, tr the traffic study that was done on Glendale Road is 10 years old. A new traffic study would need to be done. I think that should absolutely be uh, something that you can require of the actual business owner to take on as an expense because the city shouldn't have to pay for that because us taxpayers aren't trying to put a business there to walk dogs. Sarah is. So Sarah should pay for the traffic study so we have actual data on the baseline of Glendale Road traffic right now and then I think it should be put in there that then we also need to reevaluate what we think for traffic is going to be coming in and I think we can can do that only if we have a meeting where we can all talk about this together ahead of time before this is voted on. That's just something I think that you know can be put in um, as part of the application process or requirements or whatever you want to call it. Um, the I think there's one more thing that I wanted to say on here. Um, <sighs> trying to remember what it was. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, probably pretty much covers it because I know other people are going to have uh, more things to say about it, but um, I, I think it's important to understand that people may not know that the city of Northampton um, is actually, uh, you know, talking with Sarah about the conservation land and we don't know yet if Sarah is going to be selling actual conservation land in Northampton and they're actually going to be buying the conservation land. So um, 
it seems to me right now that it's going to cost a million dollars for her to to supposedly build this whole thing and then on top of it um, we don't know what the city of Northampton is going to be giving to her for money um, to buy the conservation land and current figures right now are 350 members at $365 a year which comes out to I don't know I wrote it down here somewhere I believe hundred and twenty seven five or something like that so uh, right here a hundred and twenty seven thousand dollars and seven hundred and fifty dollars that's what she has right now that she's disclosing as an actual budget is that going to be enough budget to actually sustain all the maintenance issues that are going to be involved with maintaining this property so it doesn't actually degrade all over again because it's already degraded she's supposed to be making improvements which is great wonderful idea but what happens when her operating budget of $127,000 is used up with runoff fees utility fees um, you know the staff fees that are involved um, and then if it doesn't maintain if that budget doesn't actually pay for everything to maintain the property us Glendale Road residents are stuck with a defunct business that um, didn't necessarily have to go in because one already exists five minutes away so I think we need to look at the grand scheme of what's happening on our road because our road is not designed for an unprecedented unlimited huge business coming in that again like Marianne said has no cap so I think we also need to think about there needs to be parameters in this actual um, permitting business so we can cap it because right now she can have as many customers as she wants daily passes coming in <clears throat> on and off yearly passes coming in and let's talk about the events shall we the dog pond that's going in we were just told in the last meeting is going to be uh, it could uh, have competitions they have dog competitions these jumping competitions where they go into the water so how many events are going to be here too we're not running look park on on Glendale Road we already have look park I don't understand why we're doing a huge business that's gonna have a huge impact and then none of us had any say about it so I think we need to look at the grand scheme of things when all of this is considered because just approving a permit it's not that simple it's absolutely not that simple when we have a bigger plan in place um, and I guess that's all I have to say and I hope you guys consider all of that information thank, thank you, you. Before we give a second, can, can I, is there anyone else that would like to speak before uh, someone would like to speak again? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Pion. Um, my family and I live at 340 Glendale Road. Um, we share the same concerns that have been brought up. And in addition to that, um, we are concerned about the effect of this on um, possible effect on the property values of our homes because I'm not sure that I would want to move into where I live if there was a dog park there um, and the noise there's a small um, boarding business that is just right down the street from us and with just a few dogs that there are times when the noise from those few dogs is pretty upsetting so um, those are the two things that I would like mm -hmm. you to consider. Thank you. Thank you. I think there was someone in the back, yes. Yeah. Good evening. My name is Bonnie Spaulding. I live at 942 Park Hill Road Extension with my father, Roger Benoit. Um, I, again, don't want to repeat a lot of things other people have said. I have the same concerns as like Marlene Pearson and Marshall. Um, one of the couple of the questions I wanted to ask or propose put out there is what is what is going to happen with all the existing wildlife that live back there in these proposed fenced in areas are they going to be moved to a new location or are they just going to be evicted and they have to find new homes um, the other question or concern I have is the proposed future bike path uh, apparently it starts at Glendale Road but where is it going to end? 
it just shows ending at the end of the property line. Where would it be proposed to be going to? I mean, I can't assume it's just going to be an eighth of a mile long and just end in the woods. Um, the other question I, or concern I had is the traffic. I grew up on this street. I had to go to school. I had to catch the bus and walk up from Park Hill Road Extension to the top of the hill on Glendale Road. Mm -hmm. I took my life in my hands every day just trying to get across the road to wait for the bus. We take our lives in our hands every day when we go to leave this street because cars come flying down that road at greater speeds than 35 miles an hour. And I've been driven off the road a few times trying to get out of my street. Mm -hmm. um, so what's going to happen with that? There's going to be more traffic, more chances for bad accidents, more chances for people to possibly get killed. How about the folks that live across the street in the handicapped housing? I work with folks like this every day. I drive them to and from their homes like this to program in East Hampton. These people, they're in wheelchairs, or they're on crutches, or they use walkers. How are they going to safely cross the street and not get run over by someone coming up the hill, which is blind, on a blind corner, mm -hmm. and their residence is right there at the top? They'll get killed. I mean, I, I like the idea of this proposed dog park. It, Kind of cool place for people to bring their dogs and walk off leash, not bother anybody else. Um, but I had no idea about this cluster housing being built or this proposed bike path. I actually found out about this whole proposed business on Facebook. So there was a public discussion about it on a public page, and some people were good, happy about it, and some people were not. And I just kind of read about it, and it didn't say where it was going to be other than Glendale Road. I grew up on Glendale Road. I know the properties there. And I knew there was only one of two possible places. And one of them was very small. And I know the Willard property was going up for sale because I know the Willard family. So by deduction, I deduce that that is where this was going. And it's very close to where I live. So I guess in closing, that's all about all I had to say was those are my, my concerns that were not addressed by other residents and neighbors in the in the area so thank you for your time thank you any other first round speakers yes ma'am or i think yeah hi my name is Judy randall i live at 119 prospect street and um i'm in support of the dog park because i love to walk my dogs and I love to walk them outside, and I don't like to walk them when people have their other dogs off leash and my dogs are on leash. That said, it sounds like there are issues with Glendale Road I cannot speak to. I don't know. I don't frequent it. But I did want to speak to one thing that one of the women mentioned, which is I can't in any way compare a open dog park to a closed dog park. And so when you look at that and say, well, there's one right down the street. As a dog owner, having my dogs in a confined space is hugely different than having them in a 50-acre open space. So that is one thing that I'm looking forward to, if this ever comes to be, to being able to put my dogs into a park and say, I'm not going to have to worry about them taking off. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Levant. Also, to um, going to some of the houses, some of the people had mentioned if there was any way, any way that you did not close the hearing. In other words, whatever you decide, if it could go on at, on your next agenda, that's up to you. That's up to private and private here. But that has been brought up. Um, I do, and I do want to clarify that I did ask Sarah if she would get permission from the Willards family and their attorney if we could have a site visit. And a week after she gave me the bad news that they would not do it, they told her because of the legality part of it. And since she did not own it, she said, why should I have to spend the money? And I agree with that. So there's been no communication. It's been terrible on this. Barking was another big problem. 
okay, with all these dogs starting early in the morning, possibly, Sarah, what time is it? 6.30, 7 o'clock until dawn. How is that controlled? I, 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 I don't disagree about a dog park. I'm a dog lover, but I'm having a problem without really a great amount of information. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Tom Walsbury. I live at 625 West Hampton Road. <clears throat> um, I just wanted to say that I did come to support the dog park. Um, all these documents that they've been showing have <clears throat> been available for about a month, and I've spent the last few nights, you know, reading the 160-page stormwater permit, and um, I'm actually very impressed with what they've put together. And I, I agree, Glendale Road is narrow and does have traffic issues, but again, I don't know if that should be held against her in this planning process. Um, that's definitely something the DPW and, and Marion are apparently looking into, which I think is a good idea, but I feel like a lot of issues are getting rolled into this as a focus point. And I didn't honestly plan to speak tonight, um, but I know there are a lot of emotions about it, but you know, me reading through all this, the merits of what they've done so far in compliance with the BVW and the Hannum Brook that runs through it, you know, this, this isn't, this hasn't not been thought through from an outsider. I don't know Sarah. I'm, I'm excited to have the dog park. Um, we've actually been thinking about moving, but this is, this is a major plus now for staying in Northampton, uh, having access to something like this, because we do have dogs. And I agree with what someone else said, like we always are on leash wherever we are, and coming over a hill to an uncontrolled dog puts our dog in a very defensive position, and that can end poorly. So having a place that we can let them off leash and they can be on equal footing with everyone else and that dogs will be screened to some extent to, for membership is, is a major plus for us looking into joining this park when it, when it is fulfilled. And uh, I think that's basically all I wanted to say at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments before we close? Yes, sir. My name is Donovan Tiffany. I live at uh, 122 Glendale Road. Um, I guess one of my main concerns with uh, the dog park, I like it and all, um, you know, most of what everyone said about the road is true and such. Um, but uh, what exactly happens in the wintertime when there's like three feet of snow out there? Mm -hmm. um, where does the snow go? Are the trails going to be plowed or maintained in any type of way so that if I was a member, I was able to still use these roads? Because if I paid for a year membership, I would want to have some way of knowing that uh, I guess I still had usable space out there. Um, I know currently on the conservation land, there's ways to make that space still usable and walkable because um, snowmobiles are allowed. But in these fenced in areas, um, what type of machine or what you would be doing to make that space still usable for me if I chose to use it? I guess that would be my only question. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, I'd like to address. Oh, I can answer it? Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so in my current business, we walk every day, no matter the weather. We walk in trails that have snow on it. So I'm, I'm not going to be plowing trails, but it will get padded down. Um, the road will be plowed. The parking will be plowed. Um, so as of now, I'm just planning to, you know, I'm going to have to get into business my first year and get through my first winter, I think, to see, gee, this isn't working, and kind of adjust plans. But that's my plan as of now. Yep. Um, and if I could ask a question of staff. <laughs> um, just maybe to address, uh, clearly there's an issue or concern about the accessibility and, and awareness of this project coming before us, yep. I'm assuming always a dangerous thing to do, um, that because it's before us, it's met all the requirements, it's done what it's supposed to do, and therefore it's in front of us. Do we have any ability to impact whether there's more public, you know, is that even within our ability to say, 
you know, we've had a lot of interest in more discussion before any decision is made. Are we, is that within our purview to do that, given that, as I understand it, they've met whatever they were spoken, you know, their requirements and that are, you know, statutorily required to meet? Yeah. So um, just backing up a little bit and to reiterate that um, the, we in our process encourage applicants to reach out to the extent that they can to property owners once they have a very firm plan. There's no statutory requirement. Um, obviously, it makes it's better if, if it can be um, a perfectly smooth process. Sometimes people can reach a few people, but not other people. Um, but it's not mandated, and people um, sometimes write in their applications that they attempted X, Y, or Z, and maybe it didn't happen. But that doesn't, that's not a fault of the application, per se. Um, they need to meet the requirements in the zoning. There's a public hearing process. The board only continues hearings if there's more information based on information that's lacking in the hearing process because it goes both ways. You know, you want to make sure that the applicants coming forward are pres have a clear set of rules that they abide by, but also the public needs to understand what those rules are too and it can't be a changing um, you know, target on either side. So you you really only would continue a hearing if you feel like there are things that aren't addressed. Um, but um, to, and, and this public hearing process is, that is um, very much for information um, dissemination. So people come to the public hearing obviously to understand a project more fully. Um, and when we send notice out, we make sure that the information is on the website and the people can call us um, with questions and that certainly didn't happen in this case. We didn't get any calls on this. Um, so I certainly wouldn't recommend you um, continuing it just so other uh, groups can, um, can discuss it because it's outside the public hearing. You can only consider things that are in the public hearing process. So any separate discussions that happen outside that are not legally within your purview to address. So. Um, that um, could set up um, perceptions on the part of the public that, you know, if they have these meetings outside the public hearing process, then that addresses issues from your perspective, but that's not how it works. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention, too, about traffic, I know this came up, um, is that w the traffic mitigation requirement is based on you know, there are two ways you can look at it. One is if it's a brand new project on a new site that's never had a use, the applicant addresses all that traffic, the new traffic. Um, this was a previously um, disturbed and used site, heavily used site with a much different type of traffic, but yet still um, trips were generated from the site. So it's not just, let's say, using a park standard, which is, um, would be considered typical. I think you, um, there's not a use in the ITE for every single permutation of a use. So um, it's very often categorized into like things um, to determine traffic. But so you're going to look at the difference between a gravel operation and the proposed use. So it's that change, not just all those new trips. Mm -hmm. So there is sort of this baseline of trips based on the fact that there was a gravel operation there. Mm -hmm. Can I say there's also going to be a, um, Mary ends up a meeting because of my hard, hard time. Know, we're supposed to talk about that. Oh, it's not, yeah. Well, I'll just mention it because it seems like it. But there will be, I want to continue to talk to neighbors, whatever happens, you know, and, and talk to people. So we've set up a meeting and Wayne is going to come to that also to help continue to talk to more of my practice it not really your part but my piece which some of some of the questions are about my piece the plowing of the trails or how I'm going to run it or that my limitations on parking or what will I do you know I can't really respond to people right now but um, at that meeting um, which was in meeting chambers October 20th October 20th it's going to be in the hearing room in the hearing room so for everyone um, who's a neighbor to continue to talk to me this one was a little deep Okay, questions from the board. 
I think not so much a question, but just to reiterate, in, in, in some sense, part of the discussion I think that we've heard tonight is is akin to like soccer at the Oxbow, and and in the end it had nothing to do with the merits of soccer at the Oxbow. It was about traffic, traffic up and down Island Road, and Island Road couldn't support it, and it was dangerous, and can't cross the street, and you know with people moms bringing their kids dressed in their soccer uniforms don't you know don't take Timmy's soccer g game away and it had nothing to do with that it was traffic and that's and that's what this is about uh, traffic on Glendale Road mm -hmm. as far as it's whether it or not it's a good business model or whether what their budget is a year that's not our concern if if there are five dog parks that already exist in Northampton and this is the sixth but it's allowed then that's not our concern so um, if it if it's not a good business plan it will fail if it's a good business plan it, it will survive and if it affects Glendale Road and makes the city do something on to Glendale Road that'll happen but none of that is within our purview so we're looking at something that was a non-conforming industrial use it's being proposed for something that is allowed and they've they've met most of if not all the requirements I've got a couple questions but I, I, I think everything has been met so the fact that this business doesn't exist in Northampton again it's allowed it's allowed here and that's all that we can go by so um, I have very few questions that are specifically related to what is allowed and not allowed what about ours is there any there's nothing that, I mean, we can deal with lighting, but the, but hours of operation aren't part of this, of anything that we could do, given that this is a residential area. Well, the application proposes it um, dawn to dusk, so that, and that in itself will all, um, also have sort of a cascading effect on when the lights are on in the parking lot. You wouldn't want lights on. But I was thinking of noise, actually. Dawn yeah. is pretty early in the summertime. But it's yes, similar to, but I think, to, to other, uh, like, boarding uh, businesses, kennels that we've approved. I have similar hours, I would imagine. Yeah, but indoors are out. But you also might want to, it might be helpful to have the whole map pulled up, but the separation from where the residents yeah, are. This is, these are some of the questions, though. To, that I, to the area where that would occur. Her. Um, so I don't, I think that, um, you know, as a park, that's typically when parks are open or dawn to dusk, um, except for something, um, uh, you know, that maybe something like Look Park or whatever, they might have extended hours. But many of the parks around the city are open dawn to dusk and that kind of thing. So not, you know. Um, and would the dawn to dusk include special events? Well, I think that's another issue that you could certainly stipulate because events um, may attract more than just the people who are there to use it. So, you know, it, I think it's definitely in your purview to specify, um, you know, either how many events or maybe no events at this point. And if it doesn't sound like that's on the um, the um, first few <coughs> of the proposed. Um, use so certainly any applicant for any project anywhere can always come back and have a permit amended so your first cut could say you know what see how this goes no events membership um, commercial outdoor recreation is fine and then if um, events are desired by the applicant in the future they can always come back and ask for the permit to be amended yeah that makes sense other questions? Well, I mean, I think we do have to figure out the open space, you know, whether or not the open space, right, right, you know, is. because, yeah, because that, that dog leg area was not included, in, right? So right. I don't know if that's something that that ends up becoming a condition that, that you know, is information that can be provided later, if it's something yeah. that needs to happen earlier on. But yeah, that's, that's a big, that's a big deal. Right. I mean, you could do that in, 
You can certainly do that in the condition that um, before any work begins. Well, I'm, I recommend it in the conditions anyway that the mm -hmm. conservation easement be, um, um, or conservation restriction, or whether, whatever mechanism that the applicant chooses to protect that land be done prior to mm -hmm. um, construction. And at that point, they're going to have to show exactly where that land area is and make sure that it meets the um, zoning requirements. So I think that can be a part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and if it does include um, some of the, either the trails area where the dog walking is happening or that extra <laughs> dog leg, um, then um, that could be included as well um, at that time. But that doesn't, you know, that probably wouldn't change the sort of working area, the functioning parking lot right. and building right. area. Go ahead. Uh, Carolyn, has the applicant seen the comments from staff and DPW? A number of them were addressed in the presentation. Have yes, seen I, um, I, they received the DPW comments today um, about, uh, there were several of them about the tree, not only the tree protection for the mm -hmm. trees that are remaining, but also um, the replanting for the trees. So that was sent to them. Um, and I did send my comments about, as you said, they were. Um, for the most part, addressed about the open space and the lighting. Um, so the light yeah. poles. Mm -hmm. If I can ask the applicant, just on the tree clearing, so you've got tree clearing on both parts. Um, been on the planning board for a little while. I'm, I'm not sure I've ever seen this much. <laughs> of, uh, these numbers are pretty large <laughs> for our typical cl tree clearing. Yeah, so we... Um, you could just kind of walk through kind of the before and after as, you know, your, as your plan. Sure. Um, so the dog park area, the functions with the small dog area, large dog area, is clear. In terms of tree clearing, it's really easy to develop in terms of um, mitigation for trees. The area up front on Glendale Road, the area for the cluster development, is heavily treed with pine trees, mostly pine, very few oak. Um, and our survey crew went out and, uh, according with the regulations, went and measured trees that were greater than 20 inches diameter. Um, and that, that's the trees that are shown on our, our plans. Um, then in placing, so this, this plan shows the area of the cluster development um, and the areas that we anticipate, again, Whoever develops this land um, may have a different configuration of the building placement and clearing, um, so they would have to come before you and, and make sure that they are meeting the requirements. But this is w associated with the fir with the grading and the layout as we currently show it, the numbers of trees that we anticipate removing. If I'm understanding correctly from the permit, really almost all the tree clearing is occurring in the front part of the property. The majority, yes. Yeah. Yep. And are you going to clear those trees before you sell the property, or are you anticipating what will happen when the property is sold? We're, this is a anticipation of what would happen um, to illustrate the amount of tree clearing that would need to happen. Um, we would not clear the trees yeah. if we didn't have to. So that says that if the property <coughs> was sold, anyone who wants to develop it has to come back, in essence, with a tree plan. Um, yes. Now, the number of trees, um, sort of the, I guess, the <coughs> worst case scenario for the tree removal has been identified on the plan. Um, so um, I wouldn't say, you know, if. Um, my suggested condition would be to make sure it's on the permit so anyone buying that property would be held to those permit conditions that would state that they have to show and flag the trees that are coming down and then do the replacement in accordance with the zoning for those trees that are coming down mm -hmm. over 20 inches. Mm -hmm. um, so I would definitely recommend a condition to that extent, particularly since the applicant is not intending to do that work mm -hmm. herself. Any other 
other questions from the board? Um, I had one other comment, just to sort of, again, sort of the traffic issue and the concern about maybe the trips that would be coming for the park and how can you compare this to other parks. You know, we know that there are people who walk their dogs throughout the city of Northampton at different places, the state hospital, we have conservation areas, and we know people come from other communities. So they're on our street network already, coming from wherever they're coming from to go mm -hmm. to those places. I, would, I don't know what percentage that is, but um, I would not I would assume that with um, that some of those folks that are currently visiting Northampton parks in and around would also be interested in being mm -hmm. member. I mean, you heard that in the public comment. Mm -hmm. So um, there is that piece too. It might just be sort of a shifting of where those people <coughs> are coming and going to. Yeah. Um, Public comment still open. Yes, it is. Um, I'm just I'm just bringing that to everybody's attention. Yeah. Uh, so no, I guess we should leave that until we're. You might want to go through sort of a list these of staff recommendations. Yeah. I was going to say, have we dealt with this list of seven staff recommendations? So Caroline, uh, are you yeah? Do you want us to walk us through all of those? Yeah. So actually, why don't I run through because I've also included some from Department of Public Works when they sent their um, comments um, this afternoon, so I sort of wrapped in, um, I just wanted to go over those. Some of them are details, but they're about sort of making sure that new cons um, plans are submitted prior to construction so that they can evaluate. They've asked for more details on some of the detail sheets. So um, Would that include the stormwater? and the, the Conservation Commission con conditions as well? No. So stormwater is a separate permit. So those they are, they are bound by those permit those mm -hmm. permit conditions. So Conservation Commission. Right. Same. Right. Same so thing. These are just um, engineering comments that come to you all um, in your deliberations. So um, DPW asked that um, um, Revised construction plans um, signed by um, engineer be submitted to DPW for final review at least 30 days ahead of construction, and that um, details include specification of where tracking pads are for construction, um, and trees that are to be protected are called out on the plans. Um, and clarification of any new lot line boundaries that will be established through the A&R process um, be identified on the plans, as well as tree protection details that are in accordance with the um, standard uh, <coughs> and the, um, requirements, um, and details about um, planting and how to plant um, the trees be included to ensure that the wire basket and burlap are taken completely off of the root ball um, and that they want to see the final grading for the cluster units. Um, that was actually it's shown on the plan there, but I, don't, I guess they didn't see it. Um, and then the other ones that I had submitted to you in the staff memo relate to um, conditions issue uh, prior to issuance of a building permit um, or site work relating to, you know, uh, <coughs> recording an easement in accordance with the zoning relative to the um, open space requirements and seeing those final numbers, um, recording of an easement for the trail to the city, um, and uh, a revised lighting plan, which I think has been submitted here, but that could still be the condition even though they're they're meeting it. I had recommended that um, the BUG rating or bug rating be modified so you all can discuss I, you all can discuss whether you're satisfied with that based on the reduction of the lights. So um, that's one issue that you will probably want to clean up. Um, and then prior to issuance of the building permit for any of the houses on the house lots that the tree protection measures for any of the trees to be saved must be installed and inspected. And all trees over 20 inch DBH that will be removed must be identified and um, 
uh, replacement must be done in accordance with Chapter 12.3. And then prior to a certificate of occupancy for the homes, all tree replacement um, must be installed. So that's just sort of the check for that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, prior to a certificate of occupancy for the dog park, to ensure that the tree planting that's been proposed meets those tree replacement requirements. Um, and then number one of the conditions I think they've already met on the plans um, I think can be deleted is, a, is about reducing the total number of light poles. Um, and they've offered to turn the lights off half hour after the close of the office. Um, and that's it, I believe. Uh, question on the light poles, does anybody have an issue with the, the staff recommendations was uh, to reduce to two light poles on the site, one at the entry and one in the parking. No, Though, yeah, now it's three it down, the, yeah, one and three down point. from four and nine. So it's a substantial reduction and I get the bug rating. If you have zero, that means you need more lights to right. get, yeah. so, um, and I think they're far enough removed from the road that I don't, I, and they're they're turned off a half hour early. So I don't, I don't have an issue with that quantity myself. I don't know if anybody else so do we need to do like alter that condition or just remove that? That's what's being proposed now, right. and so, so I'm, okay. I'm okay with what's being proposed. So that that wouldn't be a condition, condition. Right. right? So as I see it, going by staff comments, the conditions would be one, two, three, four, five, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And then do we want to add um, the provision for no events, no, no events public events. events? I don't know really how you would word right. that. Do we limit? Limit events to standard operating hours, or you know, allow two events just to see what an event, you know, maybe a, an event isn't bad, or maybe an event clearly demonstrates that this is a bad idea, you know. And so, Carolyn, is there a way to, um, and because there, I mean, obviously, there's not a lot on the site. I mean, is how, how is there a way for us to create that condition to say you know there can't be any events that go beyond the boundaries of the, uh, the property I mean that's one thing if you've got people parked along the lane or whatever but if people then spill out right I mean I, I think that's the you know it can we create it can can we create that condition that yeah. if there is an event it can't go beyond the you know well I think um, I think I think it's a little difficult to sort of um, um, understand what right. an event would be without having it as part of the plan and without even any description of what that may be. So I, think I would rather wait and let her get this process together and see what kind of numbers they're dealing with and the rest of it and then propose a plan. Yeah. Uh, for an event, the, the only uh, counter is too strong a word, but the only thing that they calls to mind actually, uh, Mark mentioning um, uh, the Oxbow and the soccer that we've discussed many times reminds me of was the fallout, whatever you want to call it, of mm -hmm. the ultimate frisbee. Yes, that's right. Where right. you know it seemed like all everything involved in this was good except. Right. It was wildly successful and then just exacerbated the issue for the folks on Island Drive. Right. So that, that, that's my, I'm just, you know, it, it just, it, it. So what are you saying? I'm well, not clear. Well, I'm just trying to, you know. <laughs> um, you say no events or are you saying, about what are you saying? I don't know well, what you're what, saying. What I'm saying is I think we need to consider, you know, a successful quote unquote event could have conditions or could, you know, place a, an, an even additional burden on the neighborhood. Yeah, because I, it's more successful than anybody thought it was going to be. Right. Well, I, I, I agree that's with what, that. That's what happened with the ultimate yeah, thing out at the, you know the first the, year or so out at out the, at the difference. Yeah. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. The difference with soccer, the soccer jamborees, or the ultimate okay. frisbee tournaments was traffic on Island Road was horrible, right. but then at the end of Island Road was parking. Right. Here, if an event is successful and there's only 24 spots, where does everybody go? Right. And if they're doubled up on Glendale Road, then that just I mean, makes everything got, worse. They've got the overflow on the site, the lawn overflow right. parking, well, but it's just still not having an event until she's got herself, until she understands what it is she's doing. Right. I, mean, I, I, I hear I don't from the applicant. To, sorry. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Events aren't part of my business plan. I literally have no events planned, right? I need to open it and understand how I'm operating before I would ever have an event here. So the idea of having no events until I propose one is perfectly fine with me. The only events I was thinking would be um, with Dakin or things like along those nature, you know, but and I need to be operating at least a, a year or two. So you can make that part of your thing. It's perfectly fine. You don't have to talk about it anymore. <laughs> can I ask a clarifying question about the cluster development? Maybe. Sure. So, you know, we're looking at a site layout for the cluster development yeah. on lots that are not going to be cleared or anything. So if somebody, once those are sold, would somebody come back to us yes. with new planting plans and site plans? and Or is this, once this is, you know, if we were to approve this with various conditions, is this what the only thing that would be permitted to be constructed? Is this particular site layout? So um, that's a valid question. I think the, um, you were, you're approving the site layout as shown. Mm -hmm. So the number of trees that are anticipated that would come down to um, allow this layout to happen. Mm -hmm. um, however, if someone came in and said, you know, I want to nestle, nestle a smaller house into this other location, maybe further back, and then not cut so many trees, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't consider that a reason to come back to the board. Um, if they were doing less than what you're approving on this plan, mm -hmm. if um, and and I think the location of the houses are uh, probably conceptual, except that it's meeting a setback on the one mm -hmm. side. So if the house went closer towards the driveway, I would say that doesn't trigger a reason mm -hmm. to come back. And it's the but, one drive is is in there, right? So, mm -hmm. Right. Um, so there are probably a number of changes that could happen that wouldn't necessarily require them coming back. If more trees were to be cut mm -hmm. or um, shifting sort of closer to the property lines mm -hmm. happened, that would have to come back, I would say. Okay. And, and there is no way that's, that another developer could try to fit a fourth house. No, three, you're approving three. Max three. three. That's it. Okay. Yeah. So they could go with two, they could go with one, they couldn't go with four, unless they came back to the board. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we don't <coughs> have more than three structures on a common driveway, right. so you wouldn't be able to do four anyway, even if they came back to the board. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments from the board? Clarification. Just, just to get it out there, I think just for clarification, so people understand what we've heard and what we can or cannot do about it, um, I just want to take a quick lap through what some of the comments and, and so people understand what, what is in our purview. Um, so I'll just do this quickly. So, and I apologize if I got some of the names wrong, but Alan had questions on, on the housing, parking, bike path connection, and concerns about traffic. Um, again, parking, the bike path is the city, traffic is, is not our purview. Marsha, traffic, water pressure issues, which we've heard before. Uh, Glendale Road is bad, again, not our issue. Uh, Ernest, why the cluster of houses? Uh, it's allowed and they meet the requirements right now. Marianne, lack of communication, business issues regarding membership uh, limits, safety concerns on the road. All good points, but not specific to what we can, can and cannot uh, rule on. Uh, Marlene, uh, business plan concerns, uh, lack of communication, trip data isn't applicable, uh, big events are a concern. That's the one thing that is, is under our purview, and the applicant's already said uh, she's okay with no uh, events. Uh, concern about noise and property, Kathleen. Uh, Bonnie, similar concerns uh, as others. What happens to the wildlife? We heard there's a wildlife corridor to let uh, existing wildlife from one side to the other. Um, and that's it. So, so, so the, the concerns are valid, but they're not concerns that we can rule on. And the only one that came up in all of those comments was, was the big events, uh, which the applicant doesn't have an issue with. So. Um, while I appreciate everyone's, you know, coming out and their and their concerns about the the road specifically, and 
what should or should not be done or should or should not be allowed along Glendale Road. What's in front of us is allowed, and the applicant has met the requirements. And so uh, based on what we can and cannot do, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of the project. Um, I think th I think you raised a couple of good points. I just for the board just to clarify the couple things that um, I think you all probably could um, discuss just to clarify a bit more about the membership limit. So um, membership limits are, are that would be a, an unenforceable um, mechanism for the board to address. Um, however, I think. Um, you could also look at it as potentially being sort of a built-in self-limiting thing re related to the parking. Mm -hmm. Because if someone is bringing their dog and they don't have a place to park, you've heard that Glendale Road is not safe. I don't think someone wants to take their animal off out of their vehicle on Glendale Road to walk in because there's no parking. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of, they're tied together. So um, people will, maybe no longer be members if they can't consistently mm -hmm. find parking there. So I think it sort of addresses, how, I think it's a valid point as you raised, and, and um, potentially because of the location and because of the fact that it's set so far back off Glendale Road, it's going to pull people in to park. And so I think that um, sort of the design and the site um, essentially addresses that is the, what I would suggest right. and, I, and, and the design allows for growth so right. if parking becomes an issue and people start parking on Glendale Road or membership drops because there's no parking the layout allows for future parking uh, two to three times what is already proposed is that permitted or does that have to come back well if a no. new parking area that would have yeah. to come back for an expansion of parking yeah, yeah. The applicant seen this list? Of uh, proposed conditions? Yeah. No, I identified them as issues, but not oh, specific conditions. conditions. Okay. Yeah. okay. I move to close public comment. Second. Second by Ann. All in favor? Uh, I just realized there's another comment from DPW oh. that. Um, it's minor. I just want you to know that, that uh, DPW is recommending a change in the, the Katsura tree to be planted. So that went to the applicant. I don't know if you want to put that in as a condition. The applicant has seen that. So it's just a recommendation um, because they haven't been surviving very well. Um, well they're not going to want to put in trees that haven't been surviving right. very well. So anyway. wait, that was a DPW was a DPW recommendation that wasn't a condition? It was just a recommendation? Well, they're recommending that a different tree be selected. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. I don't know that, I mean, that comment went to the applicant so they can understand that he, the tree warden has seen that they're not really surviving very well um, here, so. So what's gonna happen now is we're gonna have our conversation. The public comment period has been closed. I would just like to thank everyone for their patience and understanding uh, one of the better, more emotional uh, hearings that we've had before this board and I appreciate everyone's patience and, and how long this has been and your thoughtful comments and the time clearly that went into you coming here tonight so I appreciate that and now we're gonna have any conversation we're gonna have before we take our vote but I just didn't want people to leave without being thanked for the uh, uh, patience and respect that you showed to each other thank you uh, so again relative to the trees it's a recommendation by DPW if if the applicant chooses to plant what was being proposed and dies within a year. They have to replace yeah. it. All right, so regard, okay. Yeah. So that was just a recommendation for yeah. the type of tree. Right, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a question? I mean, like of you, maybe? Uh, have we in the past required applicants to Get do new, new traffic job. studies? Hold on. <laughs> Trying to accomplish. <laughs> I know. Oh, oh, the hearing, the hearing isn't over, but, um, <laughs> so, but this is the public part, but we still have business to conduct, so. Sorry, so, go ahead. So have we, in the past, required applicants to undertake new traffic counts, new? Um, yeah, so if there's a, if there's a need, so yes. this is a major project. Right. Uh, we do require a traffic study. They provide the traffic study. Right. That doesn't mean going out and doing a full scale right. count. Right. 
Um, and then a count isn't a study either. Yes. Right. Just so a it's just a count. Yes. So, um, yeah. So okay. it depends on the, um, yeah. on the need. I mean, you know, um, at you voiced it already. People, that's the number one issue. Right, yeah. People come to our street is the worst street in the city. Right. Every street, every street, right. be the worst right. street. Right. street. No, it is, and it's, yeah. from their point of view, it absolutely right. Right. is. And right. I understand right. that. Yeah. It's the one they know. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't hit on yet? Thanks. So. Would anyone like to make a motion? I have to put the pieces together. <laughs> I I move that more. <laughs> right. Yeah, he were. Right. I mean, I, as far as I have it, it, it's these, the ones that are stated uh, with conditions in the in one the through report. five. Right. One through five, the DPW recommendation uh, right. conditions. Tree tree. That, that, I think there are like about six of those, seven of those. Right. And then, but I thought might as the, well put the no events, events one no in. Events. Yeah, no events. Yeah. And yeah. then I thought we needed to be a little bit more specific about the conservation, the, the open space that's calculation. That's one that's of the. One of the uh, that's one of the comments. Yeah. yeah, that they just need to verify. It seems like they're in compliance, but the but there's no schedule. So we need the schedule. We need the numbers to back up what seems to be the case. So I, I had suggested in my staff memo, the applicant must record either conservation restriction for the land shown on the plan or dedicate the land in compliance okay, right. with the open That's space requirements. Uh, in to be. Right. Right. To be. Okay, to I, be. I'll make sure that when I, okay, all right. And then does the easement also get recorded? Yes. Yeah, that's Tra that trail been. easement has, should be recorded Order. prior to a building permit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Would someone like to make a move? <coughs> all right, I'll give this a shot. Uh, I move to approve major site plan for driveway for special permit open space residential cluster special permit commercial outdoor recreation dog park from Share Shots Zero Glendale Road Florence Map ID 49-4 with the following seven conditions. Uh, number one, prior to site work, a draft easement from the owner for the proposed trail along the permit site shall be recorded. Tree protection shall be installed and inspected by the city. Number two, prior to issuance of a building permit, the applicant must record the easement for the trail. The applicant must record either a cons conservation restriction for the land shown on the plan or dedicate the land in compliance with the open space requirements in 10.5. This must be a conveyed conveyance of either the restricted survey. area. Survey. Survey. Survey, sorry. This must be a survey conveyance of either the restricted area or the area to be dedicated to the city. A revised lighting plan showing specs for outdoor lighting fixtures that do not exceed 3,000 K. We didn't really touch on that. Um, or that the bug rating is not applicable anymore because they're down to one, they're not down to zero. Um, so I don't know that C is applicable anymore. Well, do you want, um, well, you can keep the 3,000 K. 3,000 K, so I'll just leave it at that. 3,000 K temperature. Number three, prior to issuance of a building permit for any of the three house lots, tree protection measures for any of the trees to be saved on site must be installed in accordance with ANSI 300 standards and inspected by the city. All trees over 20 inch DBH that will be removed must be identified in the building plans and tree replacement in accordance with chapter 230, 12-.3 must be met for these trees. Number four, prior to issuance of certificate of occupancy for any of the homes, all tree replacement required for the trees removed under 12.3 must be installed. Number five, prior to issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the dog park site, eight inches worth of additional trees shall be planted on the dog, dog park site or alternative replacement in accordance with 12.3 shall be completed. Number six, uh, there shall be no events held, nor formal events held on the premises. Uh, and number seven, uh, DPW conditions, as stated, uh, also shall be met. And what about the lights turned off half hour after close? Well, that's what's proposed. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. so that was in the proposal. Right. Yeah. That's so all I got. <laughs> seconded by Dan. All in favor? Uh, Carolyn, you have some minutes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Second. All in favor? Okay. And then I have one other thing. Oh, they had two oh. other things. Oh, I don't have any A&Rs. You said you have any Yay! <laughs> Tell us you have them. You don't have them. You don't have them. Like always. You, know. you had them. Now, I think, now I think I'm just going to put it on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In your protection. Right. So, um. Modification to 55 Maple Street to attach. So you attach structure. Right. So this just came in a few, um, I should have brought the plan. This came in a few um, meetings ago, the detached accessory dwelling on Maple Street. So there's an existing two family. Oh, yes. Oh, excuse me. Um, yes, you want to think? <laughs> um, so 55 Maple Street. Um, <laughs> There was a detached accessory dwelling in the back. It was bigger than actually an accessory dwelling. Oh, right, yeah. And in, in Forest Center. Yes. No. yes. This, is, this building stands up so tall. I know. Well, this is a. a this isn't yeah. the. This is, isn't that one? No, this isn't the condo. This is the one in Florence the Center, Maple. south yeah. of uh, Main Street, right. on the corner of Middle and Maple. John. Um, Maple. Oh. Folks, folks. We, we haven't finished our business. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have to stay, but you can <laughs> take it outside, as they say. So. Um, so originally, it had to come for site plan because it was another principal structure on the parcel. They are. They have reconfigured things, and they want to connect it to the main house. This is over close to where I live. No. no. Oh, okay, that's no. another one that's come. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, I could show you on the map. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, I think I remember this one, yeah. Yeah. And so really, it's just a quick admin change. They, this was going to be a detached carport right. yeah. with those a ADA accessible or universal right. Um, right. house. Yes. Right, 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 right. There. That's right. The 900 they now have foot. decided they'd like to extend the carport, connect to the house, and make a mudroom for themselves, and do it all at once. So. You know, just to cover all the bases, I wanted to bring that back with you because it's a minor change to the site plan, but I don't think it's enough to bring it back in. Motion and just so approve. you know. Motion to approve. Yeah. Second. Diane, all in favor? Aye. Motion to close. Second. Yeah. <laughs> all in favor? Yep.